Real immunity starts with the gut, more specifically the microbiome. In this time of the coronavirus, this show is so relevant. But you know what? This show is relevant at any time. The reason why is everybody's taking a probiotic. Find out why that can be dangerous, actually, and what bacteria you actually can take to really make a difference in your microbiome. Because as this expert has taught us in this episode, is taking probiotic actually doesn't recolonize your gut at all. Uh, matter of fact, it can do more harm. But this specific spore bacteria can actually recolonate our guts. So learn what it is, how to take it, what conditions, and even what to do to prevent viruses, right? I mean, we're all afraid. But uh, man, what a great show. This is going to be one, and I say this, you know, not every time. <laughs> You're going to want to share this. People need this information. You know why? Because most people are reaching for probiotics. But after this show, you're not going to want to take your probiotic anymore. I promise. Check it out. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm Ashley Smith. And today we welcome Dr. Tom Bain, who is the president of Microbiome Labs. He's here to discuss the latest science of the microbiome and how it relates to dysfunction and disease. Dr. Tom is a chiropractic physician and public speaker dedicated to understanding and improving the gut microbiome. So let's get started and welcome Dr. Tom and of course, Dr. Pompa to the show. Welcome both of you. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, Tom, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, this is a topic uh, that I love. I, you know, I, I, I have a very unique approach uh, to fixing the gut via the microbiome. And, utilizing my diet variation, my fasting, and even the way I use bacteria. Um, I talk about rotation. One of the first things I teach my doctors to do is take somebody off their probiotic that typically they got at the, uh, you know, the health food store that they've been on for many years and rotate it. And one of the first rotations we make is soil organisms, soil type of bacteria, which you're an absolute expert in, even developed your own product which me and my doctors all use, by the way. So thank you for that. <laughs> and, and, you know, and being upfront, I mean, you, you have a, a fantastic line of product every one of us use. So yes. you know, I'm not afraid to make uh, that recommendation, especially because you're our guest on the show and, and uh, we'll, we'll define what some of those products are. But I want people to walk away from this with a really opposite understanding of what they think of the microbiome, the importance of the microbiome, how to develop a diverse microbiome, because folks, it's not what you think, okay? And it's not as easy as just taking that one probiotic you've been on already. So yes. let's break it all down. And then Tom, here we are, Dr. Tom, in this you know, COVID coronavirus uh, you know, time, you know, when someone's going to watch this. Um, so I believe the show is, you know, will be valuable from here on years and now, even from this time that we're in right now with coronavirus. But I, I told you, I did a Facebook Live last night and I talked about my fear with the new normal. Uh, the new normal being we're back to running from bacteria and viruses and pathogens, right? right. And, and that was something, you know, that look, I, you know, we, through this last decade of science on the microbiome, we, we moved away from. You don't run from these things. You don't build them. You live comfortably with them. And those of us who have the most diverse and more bacteria and these things around us, <laughs> the healthier we are. The so, healthier we are, right, exactly. You know, so anyways, tell, tell your story. Um, I kind of set the show stage here for us, but tell your story about how you became this microbiome expert, especially in this really select topic. You know, I, uh, I met a girl in chiropractic school. Um, oh, man, we're, we're already way off. I, yeah. <laughs> where are we going with this? <laughs> you know, and that's where it all started. It always starts with a girl. Um, my wife now, my girlfriend then, uh, introduced me to functional medicine, the idea of functional medicine in the 90s. Natural medicine is really what we were calling it back then. Um, and I had the opportunity to move back to Belgium with her and uh, work in her father's uh, supplement company. So I, at a young age, I cut my teeth in the supplement industry. Uh, we were distributors in Europe for uh, uh, Jeffrey Bland and all of his Healthcom products uh, in the in the mid '90s, and uh, I, I really did every aspect of the company. I was in product development. I was in marketing. I was in 
uh, doctor education. And so it was a it was a great experience. We sold that company to Metagenics in the early 2000s, and uh, I moved back to the U.S. What I got a taste for in Europe was research. Uh, I, and I really felt like coming back to the States that I wanted to maintain, I, f- I felt like it was missing. You know, I felt like in the nutrition industry, the research was missing. And, and I wanted to kind of start a company where I could go into Zymogen, Metagenics, these different companies and, and offer them the ability to do turnkey clinical trials for them, uh, like I had been doing in Europe. And I've been working with a couple of groups here doing things like that. Well. Luckily, I didn't quit my day job uh, because none of those companies wanted to do any of that work. Yeah, they were wow. interested in, in spending any of their profits on on research that benefits the physicians who use their products. Um, so, well, at one of the time, at one point, we were hired by uh, a large company in the professional space to do a deep dive on probiotics, and so we spent about nine months going through the science of of, of probiotics and. Uh, What's interesting is that uh, there's really not a lot of science on probiotics. Uh, there's very few human clinical studies that are done on the finished formulations. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the thing in the, in the industry today seems to be uh, take five to 10 different strains, uh, each with their own clinical trial based on small, low numbers of the bacteria being used in a single dose for a single symptom, let's put them all together and say we treat all 10 of these symptoms. That's not science. And uh, we tried to explain that to some of the companies, they weren't having it, uh, too much invested in the process, so they, didn't, they weren't willing to change. This one company was interested, it took us nine months to explain our findings, and we found some, uh, some spore-based bacteria at the University of London that really had some interest data on it. And, and explain and, spore. I don't want people just to get lost right there. Yeah. So there's types of bacteria that as part of their defense to their environment, they can dehydrate themselves, form a tough protein outer coat and go into essentially an inert state while they wait for their environment to change. And when their environment becomes more conducive to what they're looking for, then they come out of their spore state and they are active again. Um, so there's a difference between spore-based bacteria and soil organisms though. So a soil organism is actually a functioning bacteria that does most of its work in the soil. Now, uh, spore-based bacteria, they use the soil as a vector to move from host to host, but they themselves are actually, uh, they're actually human bacteria. They're actually commensal bacteria. So there's a slight difference. Uh, you do see some spores in products that are, are marketed as soil-based organism products. Um, but that's, that's their uh, m- misuse of, of, the, of the term. Uh, so these are gut commensal organisms. That means they're active when they're in the gut. Um, we have data that shows that they function in the gut of insects, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, everything. And it's not, it's a, it's not just a question of, you know, is it okay, does it, does it live there? we've actually been able to show that there are receptor sites in the GI tracts of all of those organisms specific for these uh, bacillus-based spores. And so it's a whole different way of looking at uh, probiotics. You know, we've been taught, we're going to reseed your bowel with good bacteria. Well, there's zero science that supports that notion. Uh, Many of the probiotics that are in the marketplace are dead on the shelf. Uh, but that's okay. They're okay being dead because they're really cell signaling molecules. They're not probiotics. They don't go into your digestive tract. They don't change the microbiome. They may trigger a symptom. They may trigger your immune system to correct a symptom like bloating or, or gas, uh, but you're not shifting the microbiome. Our, our goal was, to, what if we could really shift the microbiome? What would happen? And that was a question we we built the company around. And you know, you'll see as, as we've gone through, it's been an interesting process and not one I could have even dreamed of as far as the doors that have opened up and the research possibilities that have, that have dropped on our laps. But so when, when, what spores do is they recondition the bowel. Yeah. They use, they're, they're transient organisms. They spend three to four weeks, 21 to 27 days in your digestive tract. And while they're there, they're just kicking butt. They, ju- they use quorum sensing to talk to the bacterial environment. And then they get rid of the bad guys. And sometimes the bad guys are actually the good guys 
they're just in the wrong place. As you try, like small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And so they have the ability to communicate with the bacteria. And if they can't coax them into doing what they should be doing, they'll kill them off. So they have the ability to produce 25 different antibiotics. Uh, they use very specific uh, competitive exclusion techniques against yeast and bacteria. And so what they do is by getting rid of the bad guys, and then in the process of doing that, they make waste products that feed the good guys. And so that's science. That's changing the microbiome. Um, I'm going to give you this bacteria and it's going to go live in your mind. Thank God that doesn't work, right? Because we would be killing people. We would yeah. have been creating redundancy in their microbiome. We would have been creating, instead of having thousands of beneficial bacteria in their gut, they would be having 10. Yeah, I, I uh, call it monoculturing, right? It's right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, fortunately, it wasn't what we were telling people it was. Because if it was, we would have been, create, we would have been doing harm. Right. So, so there's no harm in giving those dead bugs, but you're not changing the microbiome. You're treating symptoms. And that's okay. I don't have a problem with people who choose to treat symptoms. It's not my choice. It's not what I do. I want to get to the source. I want to change the situation and, and see, then see what heals when the microbiome changes. So again, the, the difference between the probiotic that someone buys in the store, typically it's dead, but it still acts as a signal in some respects, but it's not changing the microbiome. The, uh, the spore type if you will, do change the microbiome and even survive the gut acid. So let's yeah. say you were lucky enough to actually get a very active colony of, of product. Most of that is killed. Kind of explain that because the spores, uh, they, they survive it. They can deal with the high acid. They can deal with high temperatures. You don't have to keep them in the refrigerator. So they can deal with the stress out here and in here. Explain that. Yeah, so, so the, the, the spores are... Um, they're so resilient to their environment. And, and that's, they, we've co-evolved with these things. So the, the, the human immune system is actually dependent on early exposure to spores for the development of the immune system. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing. But when you look at the lactobifido-based products that are in the market, if they're alive, as you say, oftentimes they're not, if you get a good one that's alive, many in the professional uh, market, they are alive when we analyze them on initial testing. But the minute they hit the stomach acid, they're dead, uh, with a few exceptions. Lactobacillus acidophilus, uh, it likes acid. It's dead instantly when it hits the bile salts. So even though, you know, so when you see some of the survivability studies on, on lactobacillus, they just show you the stomach acid, and it'll live in the acid environment of the stomach. Bifidobacteria will not. Mm. Um, and so, so it, but then if it hits the, the bile salts, it's dead within seconds. Uh -huh. So, so... But there's data out there that shows in some cases, the research shows that the dead bacteria actually performs better than the live bacteria. Okay. So it's the DNA from those bacteria that yeah. are getting to the payer's patches, getting to the gall, triggering a symptom in the immune system and then changing a, a symptom. You know, I, uh, there's a good, good data on lactobacillus rhamnosus GG and the treatment of... Uh, of chronic urinary tract infections in women, right? So swear to God, this is a great story, okay? So a rep comes in and starts talking to me about study. So I'm like, well, how, how does this work? And he goes, well, let me tell you. He said, eat the lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. It goes down and it gets into the vaginal tract. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's that tract? I missed that anatomical tract from mouth to vagina. And he's telling me that the bacteria go live in the vagina and then they fight off the infections of urinary tract infections. Now, in no way, shape, or form do I want anybody to hear me disputing the findings of this study. But I vehemently dispute the mechanism they're telling me why it worked. There's yeah, but no see, that, that was what was marketable because people could process that, right? They right. go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I go, here, and it goes there. Okay, I got it. But in reality, it, it's not so simple. It's not that at all. Those dead bacteria... They get to the payer's patches, make, it triggers an immune reaction, and, and downstream, that shifts the pH of the vaginal tract, and that prevents it from being an infectious receptacle. So the, these, just these barren patches that you're talking about in the gut, that's where you make macrophage, uh, you know, which uh, a first line of immune system to the point of why it works. So it affected that, 
which we know bacteria affects that, and then right. it produces these white blood cells. So produce the symptom, which is great. And and in situations where I've got somebody with an acute urinary tract infection, I go to Whole Foods, go to, go to Walgreens and get some lactobacillus rhamnosus GG while we give you the megaspore so that we can recondition your microbiome, which is the reason out here in the first place. Um, and we'll get to the source of why you're having chronic urinary tract infections. In the meantime, let's treat the symptoms so you're feeling more comfortable. You know, so so with the spores, when, when they get through, through the stomach acid, they're in 100% spore form. So they survive through. Within six minutes of being in the small intestine, they come out and they start reconditioning. In the lower part of the small intestine, they resporulate. We don't know why this is, but we do know that that process is what triggers the stimulation of the pears, patches, and the gall. It creates that immune reaction that we're looking for. That's that long-term exercise to our immune system that we want to, want to give it with the, with the probiotic. So uh, you had brought up SIBO earlier. That's when you have bacteria that are very important in the large intestine, and they can even be bad guys for that matter. But right. when some of these bacteria end up in the small intestinal tract, we call it SIBO, uh, right. small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Do, do these spores affect those though? Meaning if they don't activate until maybe the large intestine or the lowest part of the small intestine, can they still be effective against that condition? Which by the way, is perhaps 80% of irritable bowel syndrome. It's the most underdiagnosed uh, condition in my opinion in, in clinical practice. But um, so there, that's, first of all, the answer is yes, it's the best probiotic that you can use for small intestinal bacterial but, overgrowth. By the way, because small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, regular back pro probiotics makes it worse, typically. Right. Typically, right. And that's a histamine reaction usually. Um, so the, the um, spores, because they resporulate in the lower part of the small intestine, this gives the immune boost, which is good for the small intestine bacterial overgrowth patient but you're not getting any competitive exclusion when it's in spore form. Yeah. So if you've got the, the rare type of SIBO where you contracted an infection and it's living in your small intestine, megaspore will destroy it 100% of the time. Only problem is that's probably one out of every thousand SIBO patients that you see. The other 999, it's a ileocecal valve issue where the good bacteria is crawling back into the small intestine from the large intestine. And so in that scenario, we, we do recommend that patients still use an antimicrobial, especially in the beginning, because there is no um, competitive exclusion at, at, that large, at the lower part of the small intestine where the bulk of that infection is. Right, yeah, it is. It's typically right there. Right. So, okay, that was a, a great answer. Right. Um, okay, you know, so these, these spore types of bacteria, uh, they can last the stomach acid. What about, and I've been asked this question many times, uh, you know, can I take them with my antibiotic if they're more, you know, resistant, whereas, you know, other bacteria's antibiotic, you might as well not even wait, you might as well just wait till you're done. What about these with antibiotics? So first of all, um, we, we've uh, been working with the, uh, with Cal State Sacramento. They've got a microbiome laboratory at, at the university. And so we uh, did a contribution to them last year year we've been working with them and so we are have been doing some actual specific antibiotic studies um, and so so we hope to have those sometime in the fall that obviously certain things right now have slowed down but but um, we'll have specific information about the different antibiotics but here's the thing what we're seeing in the small scale things that we've done is there's no destruction destruction of the, of the spores with antibiotics whatsoever. Yeah. They actually produce antibiotics on their own. And so, you know, some, some of the patients just can't get past that. Even some of the docs can't get past that. So we'll say, all right, fine, take it at a different time of the day than the antibiotic. But in our experience, we don't see any issues one way or the other. You got both of them in your hand at the same time and take them at the same mouth. I, clinically, I've experienced the same thing. I, you know, I, I wanted to ask the question because I've yeah, been asked the question. Well, it, would be like, uh, it would be like, it would be like, you know, if, if you're producing something, you're producing an enzyme or something like that, and then dying of an enzyme. It's like, it, it can't work that way. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the spores make single antibiotics that are very specific. 
and very geared towards specific types of bacteria. It's not a broad spectrum antibiotic like what, what is uh, typically used in, in, as a drug. But, um, but we've tested it. And like you say, your own clinical experience, my own clinical experience too, it works. But we're working to get the type of data that we need so that we can definitively say that. And uh, we should have that by the fall. You know, I, I, I rarely do cellular healing TVs where I, I sell a product. It, it, it's about bringing information. But uh, in right. a case like this, uh, we, we, ha we have to tell them about the product. Because right now, if I were viewing this, I'd be like, okay, so this is just a bunch of information. What is the product? <laughs> so right. exactly. I'm not afraid of that right now. I'm selling you a product right now, folks. It's called right. Megaspore Biotic is the product you created. And, um, and I, and I, I'm even give you an opportunity. I, and again, I hate sales shows because this is an information show, but you have several products that I utilize clinically. So do all my doctors. And so I, I want to give people a chance to understand each one of them, because these are products that are very different from what you've ever, you know, used. So, you know, let, let's talk about the Megaspore Biotic. You know, you already said why it's different than a probiotic. There's other spore products coming out on the market. It wise years difference. Okay, I'll give you the chance to say that. But then I want people listening to be able to utilize it. So then I want you to say, here's how you dose it for cer certain conditions. And I'm uh, clear you're not treating any condition. Yeah. You know, but you know, let's help the people. You know, understand how to use it for certain conditions, and then use some of the other products that will complement it. So I want people to walk away with something here. So. Um, why is your product better than the other sport products that are coming out? So it's, it's simple. It's very, very simple. The spores, it's a really cool story, right? You, you love the story already. And even if you've only had it heard a little bit of it, it's a great story. But if the spores aren't in spore form, they don't survive the stomach acid. They don't survive the bile salts and they are useless and just nothing more, not useless, but they're nothing more than a cell signaling molecule like your typical lactobifidobase based bacteria. So we perfected the, the science of keeping the spores in spore form. We are the only product that is 100% spore form. And so, so when you, what we do is we take products off the shelves and we test them. And um, some of the probiotic spores that are in the marketplace, some of, there's uh, some single spores that are in the retail brand. We've tested them at times and they were actually 0% spore form. And so what happened when, when the whole spore thing became part of the supplement industry, a couple of companies just ran yeah. and started distributing products. They initially were selling it as lacto, lactobacillus sporogenes. So they just made up a name with it, okay? So, but they did not work on stabilizing the product. So when our, the group that we work with, when they got the information, this was at the same time, everybody got the information, they took the bacteria and they're like, holy cow, these are so unstable. We can't sell this product. And it took them almost seven years to figure out how to get them 100% in spore form. So you have to be able to grow the bacteria under, fermenta and under fermentation. So it's got to be viable. It's got to be in its vegetative state. It's got to be functioning, making babies, doing what bacteria do, right? But then you have to shock them back into spore form. So we have a proprietary... 10 step process to, to, to shock them back into spore form. That's the difference. Um, and what happens is like maybe you, in, in, when you start, maybe you're only 30% uh, uh, not spore form, but as it sits there and they sit next to the other ones that are in spore form, it triggers the other ones to come out of their shell. So then by the time the patient gets the product to take it, it's almost no spore form. That's, that's the main difference. The other thing is, uh, we have the worldwide exclusive distribution rights for uh, Bacillus Indicus. And that's a very unique product. That, that, that product actually uh, produces RDA levels of carotenoid antioxidants in your intestinal tract, right at the site of absorption. So carotenoids, like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, are also very sensitive to uh, the stomach acid. So the RDA of, of beta carotene is 800 milligrams. That's actually with the hope that eight are going to slip past your stomach acid and be absorbed. And so, so we're actually producing 800 milligrams of, of beta carotene at the site of absorption. So very unique strain. So that's another. Uh, yeah, you sell a product. Um, you can say the product's name, the HU58, which is specifically that one strain. That's how incredible it is. So actually, 
the H58 is the Bacillus subtilis. Okay, the subtilis, yeah. The subtilis is the biggest, baddest competitive excluder and immune modulator in the formula. That's the one I was saying. So the other one is only the one you, I don't want to get people confused. Okay. That's my mistake. So the, the Megaspore biotic is the, the your main flagship product that yep. contains the first one you said it contains indicus. five strains the it indicus contains, is one of them indicus h58 two okay um, it contains clausi bacillus clausi okay. bacillus coagulans and bacillus lichenformis so five. it's a five spore blend h58 it's interesting how that came about h58 is a massive ammonia devourer it eats the bacteria and the ammonia itself. So we created a high dose of just that product that we use in patients with uh, liver failure and excessive amounts of, of ammonia in their system. So we did a clinical trial with that in 2018. We've got another study that's going on. There's parts of the United States that have very high levels of unemployment and alcoholism, and there's lots of liver failure. And uh, the treatment for those patients is almost as bad as the disease itself. And so we've got some good leverage with a couple of uh, GI centers that are doing research for us on liver failure, hepatic encephalopathy uh, with the HU58 standalone. So, and then you, um, and you have another product, the ProFloor, explain that, uh, that one. So let, let, let me back up though before you do that. Let's talk about the, the flagship product, the dosing. Yeah. Where would somebody start with the Megaspore Biotic? Because we typically have to start low because oftentimes they can get a die off, right? And then we work up to higher doses and how high for certain conditions. Go ahead. You know, what's funny is that I probably had 100 to 125 people on the product before I saw anything negative, right? So here I get the first 50 on it and, and all I'm seeing are the results. I'm not getting anybody who's complaining of anything bad. And I'm giving them the full dose right out of the gates. So I got on a, a call with the people, uh, the, the scientists who created the product. And I'm like, hey, guys, I'm like, I don't see any negatives here. I hang up the phone and the next three people that walk in the door are all having really significant die off reactions. So I've come to the conclusion in, in all of my experience, I've come to the conclusion that about 15 percent of the people have problem with the product of those 15 percent. 80% of those people, it's a very mild thing. A little yeah. bit of boost, no, it's mild. Little yeah. crampy thing, maybe. That's about it. But those other 20%, they're the ones that keep you up at night. They're, they're the ones that are having really strong detox reactions, lots of explosive diarrhea, intestinal cramping. Those seem to be the big ones. Um, but we've seen everything that you would see with a Herxheimer reaction, from rashes to headaches and, and everything else. So what we recommend across the board, because... I can't muscle test it. I can't look in their eye and see who's going to do it. I can't take a blood test and see who's going to detox. I can't figure out who it's going to be. So we just put everybody on the titration schedule. And that's, so the full dose is two caps a day taken with a meal. So the titration schedule is take one cap every other day for a week, take one cap, and then the next week, take one cap a day for the week. And then the next week, take, go up to your full two week, uh, two cap a day dose. When we get to two caps a day, the dosing is at the same time. We don't split it. And the reason is that stimulation of the pears patches in, in, the, in the immune system of your gut, that's a numbers game. And until we get to that second capsule, we're really only getting competitive exclusion and nutrient production. We're not getting that immune modulating benefit that we're looking for. And in many of our autoimmune patients and things like that, it's like, that's critical, right? So, so we've got to get to that dose. So if we separate the dosing, we do one in the morning, one at night, we don't get that stimulation because it's not, it's not a high enough dose. Um, when it comes to, you know, that, so there's that dose, two caps a day, that's it. And I keep it at that. If I get into a situation where I feel like I need more help, I add one or two caps of just a straight HU58. Because if I need help, I need help with competitive exclusion and immune modulation. And that's what the HU58 does. So rather than increasing all five of the strains. I'm already getting RDAs of the, of the antioxidants. I don't need more of that. And so what I need is I need more competitive exclusion and more uh, immune modulation. So in those cases where I've got somebody on, on two a day, uh, I'll then start to add one a day at the age of 58 and then two a day at the age of 58. So, you know, and this gets into the conversation about dosing, right? 
well, Tom, your products only got four billion per serving. My my lacto products got fifty billion, a hundred billion, nine hundred billion, right? And that's all marketing. That's yeah. all marketing. Uh -huh. There's no study that shows fifty is better than twenty, or that nine hundred is better than one hundred. There's not, never been a study that shows that. But it's about an effective dose. You've got a hundred trillion bacteria in your gut, and so if you're going to drop a hundred billion lactobacillus in there, it's like it's like a drop in a pond. Yeah. Right. Right now, if you don't take any of the spore-based probiotics, you got about 2 million spores in your gut. So when you drop 4 billion and you're giving 2,000 times the native population, that's what creates the stimulation of the payers' patches. If you could get a lactobacillus bifidobacteria-based product and you, you supplemented it in those terms, you would have to give people 10 bottles of the product a day to get, to get that, that magnification of, of the dose that's already there. So, so that's, uh, that's, yeah. I think I've gotten off track a little bit. Yeah, no, 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 you got it. I mean, just on the dosing, I mean, you, you explained yeah. it really good, actually. Um, just to listen, work up to two yeah. of the mega spore biotics at the same time, because you need that number, uh, you know, hitting the power patches at the same time. If you're a chronic case, instead of increasing more mega spore, then add the HU58. Now, what about the Restore Flora, which is another product that has, I think, three of those five? You know, kind of got, when do you use It's got that? three of the five, and then it's got some uh, Boulardia in it. So, so here, you know, full disclosure, I'm just one of you, I'm just one of the guys, right? I'm just, I'm a chiropractor, yeah. and I've got this functional medicine practice. I've got this clinic, I've got this great product of Megaspore. I've got this clinical study going on on the HE58 with hepatic encephalopathy. And for the first time in my career, I'm starting to see in my practice, people with C. diff. I'm seeing older patients that have gone in for hip replacement or knee replacement, and now they've got C. diff. So I start going, what can I throw at this, right? So the first few seem to respond pretty well just to the megaspore. Um, but I was seeing relapses. So I started working with the HU58 and the Megaspore in combination. There's a lot of good data on Boulardi and, um, and, and C. diff. And so I put together the Restore Flora and I have those three products are my C. diff protocol. So if somebody's on C. diff, I give them well, first of all, I encourage everyone to intermittent fast. So I try to keep them at two meals a day. But I, so what I do is I give them two caps of the Megaspore in the morning, two caps of the Restore Floor in the afternoon, two caps of HU58 in the evening. And so are the spores function better when there's protein and sugar around. So it's yeah, by the way, that, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about too, is yeah. your recommendation is taking these after meals, which is really different than other probiotics also. Exactly. Right. And so we found that the, that the spores function about 20% more uh, when they're in the presence of, of sugar, in the presence of protein and sugar. And so when they get into small intestine, there's food for them, they get all excited and, uh, and they function uh, at, with a higher degree. And so, so again, and it, it ultimately comes down to studying your product. If you don't study your product, you can't say what it does. I can tell you what my product does in the ascending colon and the transverse colon, and the descending colon. I can tell you what it does in a small intestine. I can tell you everything about it. Nobody else can tell you those things. They don't do this, just the basic research to show you, hey, here's a clinical model of a human intestinal tract. Let's observe what happens when your probiotics in that intestinal tract. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. That's why I love your product. It's studied and you really help people, you know, with when and how to take it. That's why I wanted to cover it. All right, let, let, let's hit the 800 pound grill in the room, at least this time of year, the, the COVID, the coronavirus, right? You know, I uh, have been doing a webinar and I, like I said, my Facebook live uh, that I did, it had, you know, major, major, uh, at least 150 some thousand, it might be 200 now, I don't know, views on it just in the last 24 hours. But because I talked about real immunity, I talked about this new normal of now running from bacteria, spraying everything, wearing masks, right, is my concern that, I, you know, this can go on, this new fear of bacteria, viruses, pathogens yeah. in general, everyone's sterilizing. When the last decade, 
has shown us that we don't kill these things, right? We live with them, an immune system, you know, that is around more bacteria. I even quoted some studies, you know, kids yeah. growing up on farms being, you know, basically the more microbes they encounter, especially as children, the more strong their immune system. And this corona thing could take us far off that, Tom, 10 years of all this research. And now yeah. everyone's going to be running from this. What are your concerns about that? Undone in one month, right? All that good progress. Undone, undone in one month. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's, it's dangerous. It's a, it's a dangerous slope we're on. And, and it's, you know, it, it feeds the, the vaccine industry. That's really who yeah. benefits from this story. That's it. Uh, patients don't benefit. Um, so the, the interesting thing, so in 2017, we published our first study and, and that was a, the human leaky gut study. So we did, uh, we, we built a model for how to create a leaky gut in healthy people. And then we fixed it with our probiotic. And so awesome, right? Cool study. And this is the thing because my story hasn't changed. The world around me has, okay? What that study shows is that the amount of LPS, lipopolysaccharides, circulating in the bloodstream at five hours after a meal was reduced dramatically in patients that took the probiotic. And in patients who did not take the probiotic, that it actually increased over time. So the difference between the people taking the probiotic and the people not taking the probiotic was huge. And the LPS is the, this is essentially the low grade septicemia that happens after every time we eat. And what happens is the LPS spills out and then there's a cascade of cytokines that are created in response to that. And that's how our innate immune system deals with the really bad thing of uh, septicemia, right? That's that, that's that process. Eating creates a low grade septicemia in just about all of us, right? So what happens? They, we eat, LPS goes out, and there's a, a, a short increase in the cytokines for a period of time. And that process is at the root of everything you wanna talk about right now. So any autoimmune disease, any digestive disorder. It, it, it drives vaccine, inflammation. It, drives, it inflammation. drives inflammation. And so what we're seeing with the COVID-19, what we're seeing the people who, who end up on ventilators, we're seeing this cytokine storm, yeah. okay? What that means is that there has to be an underlying cytokine activity going on before they get the virus. Mm. So in that scenario, Leaky gut is the number one cytokine producer across the board. So when you look at people like, oh, this guy, he was 30 years old and, oh man, he was really healthy. No, he wasn't. That's right. He was not healthy. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but healthy people don't have the existing cytokine levels that trigger the storm. Absolutely. Even though he looked healthy, even though he was a fit guy or whatever, he was not healthy. Was it the leaky gut? Maybe. Was it early onset autoimmune disease that was really being driven by the cytokine storm from leaky gut? I don't know, but there was something going on. And so the story doesn't change. And, and, and here we are, the best thing that you can be doing to improve your immunity is to have, fix your leaky gut. It's to reduce the cytokines that are associated with the spillage of LPS after a meal. Mm -hmm. And so that's the number one thing that people should be doing. Yeah, I mean, simply put too, I mean, people today, it's so funny, you have to use, you know, media to, uh, to help educate, meaning, you know, you go, oh, you know, you've seen those yogurt commercials, 70% of your immune system starts in the gut. Oh, yeah, you're right. You know, it's like, okay, great. We're going to piggyback on that now <laughs> because, you know, that's that allowed people to get this before, before those darn yogurt commercials. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was very difficult for me, people to under, get people to understand that your bacteria here affect your immune system. Mm, don't understand that. But, but now yogurt companies have made it a little bit easier for people to get that. Um, obviously, like you're explaining a much better scientific approach to why this would be good to prevent uh, a virus of any sort, you know, obviously the coronavirus, you know, because it really is affecting a very select group of people, right? And when you look at diabetes, heart disease, older people, obese people, 
they have one thing in common, and it's this overproduction of inflammation, to your point. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and then that creates this overreaction in the lungs, the cytokine reaction. That can obviously, lack of oxygen, shut you down and kill you. And, yeah. you know, but again, so when we're looking at all of these things to do to build immunity, you know, real immunity actually starts with your microbiome. And again, that's my problem because there's studies showing this microbiome here affects and communicates with this microbiome here, with right. this microbiome here, here. And, and so therefore we're, you know, destroying it, number one, with all the hand sanitizers. And then we're not getting, we're trying to be sterile, which we know long-term is a fail as far as improving our immune system. So a lot of, a lot of problems here. <laughs> Big time. Well, it's interesting. So from that one study, from that one leaky gut study, we were contacted by over 30 different researchers. Mm -hmm. And the reason we were contacted by them is because each of those researchers in their own specialty had run into a wall. And the wall that they ran into was how do we reduce LPS in the circulation? Because that's the cause of the autoimmune disease that I'm doing research on. That's the trigger that takes, somebody from hyperglycemia to diabetes and, th and these aren't my reasons that's the american diabetic association that's saying that they're saying the number one thing that we should be looking for diagnostically is lps but that's the main driver that takes somebody from hyperglycemia to diabetes so i was in my office one day with a patient and my phone rang and it was it was unusual for my for somebody to get through but this guy somehow made it past my front desk and it turns out he's one of the leading researchers in the world on melanoma. And so he does checkpoint therapy, immunotherapy. But he spent his entire life, Harvard undergrad, Harvard med school, uh, Yale postdoc, Stanford postdoc. I mean, the guy's the man, right? From the beginning, he's been saying the only difference, so, so checkpoint therapy works 20% of the time. So 20% of the time, people with stage four cancer take this therapy and they are healed from stage four cancer. It's pretty remarkable. There's only a few types of cancer it works on, but nonetheless, it's pretty remarkable. His question was, when he was in postdoc, was why? Why is that? He's done 35 years of research and the only thing he can figure out is that people that it works in have high levels of short chain fatty acid producing bacteria in their microbiome. And people who don't, it doesn't work. And people who have none, it actually makes, the, the medication actually makes them worse. And so that's about 10% of the population that but takes so, so people understand the certain bacteria, um, obviously these, these spore uh, you know, types that we're talking about help us produce more of these, but um, they, they actually poop out, if you will. <laughs> There's a waste they produce that produces a short chain fatty acid that I've read can make up to be like 30% of our energy, period. So if you don't have- 100% of the energy of the colonocytes of, of your colon. But, but I'm talking about just your cellular energy. But right? cellular energy, yeah, at least. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's an understatement. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, but people yeah. don't get that. So it's like, if you're not producing these bacteria, you're not making these short chain fatty acids that number one, also feed your other bacteria. Right. <laughs> so it's a food to other bacteria, helps the mucus linings be stronger. That's a stronger yeah. immune system. Yeah. creates more diversity, you know, and obviously uh, gives us this immediate cellular energy, which, uh, man, there's, there's a lot there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so the, the, his feeling is that if, if, uh, if we can get the same type of change in cancer patients that we saw in healthy patients, then in his uh, specialty, the survivability rate should go up over 50%. Mm. Wow. And, it's just, and that would be a, a, an initial uh, loading period before the immunotherapy starts, then the immunotherapy with the probiotic and, and prebiotic in combination, and then uh, monitoring their, their improvements. So it's, it's fascinating. You know, uh, I had no idea what doors were going to open when we did that study showing the reduction in endotoxemia. So, but it's been quite remarkable, all of the things that have, have come about. So we've got... Uh, 15 studies that are going on right now. Um, we've got 14 studies that have, are done waiting for publication. We've got five studies that are published. There's nobody in our space doing that stuff. Mm. You know, when I yeah. go into a conference and I, you know, I'm at A4M and there's all these other companies there, I'm like, I can stand there and say, no one in this room is doing the level and the types of research that we're doing. And we're doing it at Cleveland Clinic, NYU. I mean, we're not doing these in our garage. 
Um, we're doing this in, in a high level teaching universities and teaching hospitals throughout the US and, and Europe. And so, so it's the real deal. And, yeah. uh, and it's, it's how my, my thing is, you know, I, I go to these industry wide meetings and, and that's all I say. They're like, hey, Tom, can you say something else? I'm like, no, can you start doing some research? Can you stop feeding me marketing and give me something that I can definitively show my patients is going to change their life? Yeah. Until you do that, you're not really doing anything for me. No, nah, Tom, uh, that's why you're on this show, man. Because you know, I, I, you know, I've been through what's real, what's not, the marketing versus real science around something. And uh, you know, when I started reading the science, I, I immediately was convinced. I, I immediately became more critical of the garbage that's out there yeah uh, you know around probiotic and just the deception that's around it and look I, you know it's this these bacteria are important it, this is real immunity we're talking about today exactly uh, right everyone's jumping on the bandwagon at this time right now you know with the corona and you know everyone's hucking a product one way or another but uh, what, what you're talking about tom uh, the science supports this is real immunity here exactly yeah, yeah. so well, listen, I appreciate it. We, we have the links, and I'm sure Ash has already put up a link on how to get Megaspore um, in the products that you mentioned every time you mention them. So <laughs> we'll have yeah. in the show notes as well, you know, how, how to get the product. Tom, th thank you for coming on. Just a wealth of My knowledge on this, on this subject, and I, I appreciate you bringing it, especially at this time. Hey, I love what you do. I love uh, supporting you in any way I can, too. So uh, keep, keep up your good work. We need more people like you, and we need to get the truth out there. So thank you for everything you do, too. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. All right. Take care. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. This episode was brought to you by Cytodetox. Please check it out at buycytonow.com. We'll be back next week and every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. We truly appreciate your support. You can always find us at cellularhealing.tv. And please remember to spread the love by liking, subscribing, giving an iTunes review, and sharing the show with anyone you think may benefit from the information heard here. And as always, thanks for listening.